Hey, this is Aaron Rabinowitz for CreativeCow.net. Okay, here's the situation. You animate a layer with several keyframes and realize that while you like the motion, you want it to happen on a smaller or larger scale. In other words, even though the overall shape of the motion is perfect, you want it to fit into a smaller or larger area. Unfortunately, After Effects doesn't include a tool for easily scaling motion paths, so other than changing each keyframe one by one, which may not give you exactly the same look, there's really no simple solution. Or is there? Well, at the risk of sounding anticlimactic here, yes, there is a way, but it's a bit roundabout in the way that you get there. And it's not exactly a perfect solution, but, you know, it's pretty useful nonetheless. A 2D motion path is made up of spatial keyframes, which, when you get down to it, are simply points with coordinates on the X and Y axes. Between each keyframe, there are lines that connect each point to make the motion path, and the shapes of the lines are determined by what type of interpolation each of those keyframes uses. For example, Auto Bezier keyframes make the path curvy, and linear keyframes give the motion sharp angles. Now, another feature in After Effects also utilizes the same system of connecting points to create different shapes. That feature is called Masks, or Layer Masks, which, as you probably know, is a tool generally used in creating transparency on a layer by connecting points to create a shape that masks part of the layer. So here's the kicker. Since both motion paths and layer masks share the same basic properties, it turns out that a motion path can be converted into a mask shape, and that a mask shape can be converted back into a motion path. So how does that help us? Well, while you can't scale a motion path, you can scale a mask, which means that if you convert your motion path into a mask, then you can scale it up or down, or for that matter, even rotate it if you want to. Here I have an After Effects composition of a red ball moving over a picture of a star that I made in Adobe Illustrator. I set up the ball's position keyframes to match the star shape and, as you can see, the ball follows the path perfectly. But what if I wanted to make the ball move around inside the star instead of on it, but otherwise follow the same motion path shape? In other words, how can I scale down the motion path to fit inside the star? Well, here's how we do it. Create a new solid layer the same size as the composition by choosing Layer, New, Solid. The solid's color and name don't really matter because we're only using it for a moment before we delete it, so just ignore those properties. Choose Make Comp Size and click OK. Next, select all of the position keyframes for the ball layer by clicking on the word Position, which, as you can see, highlights all of the keyframes. Next, choose Edit, Copy, which copies all the keyframes. Next, select the new solid layer and choose Layer, Mask, New Mask. As you can see, it creates a rectangular mask the same size as the layer. With the mask layer still selected, hit M on your keyboard to reveal the mask shape property. Select the mask shape property by clicking on the words Mask Shape. Make sure you select the mask shape property and not just the layer, because otherwise our next step will just transfer our ball layer's position keyframes to our solid layer, which is something that we don't want. Next, choose Edit, Paste. As you can see, a new mask shape is created and it looks just like our motion path. Now, let's scale it. With the mask still selected, hit Control T, or if you're on a Macintosh, Command T. A free transform bounding box will appear around the entire mask shape. You might be familiar with the bounding box from Photoshop or Illustrator. Now we can scale this down by grabbing hold of any of the bounding box handles. In this case, I'll do that while holding down Control, Alt, and Shift, or if you're on a Macintosh, Command, Option, and Shift, which has the result of scaling the mask around its center point with its aspect ratio locked so it doesn't get distorted. Also, it lets us see the original shape of the mask along with the new one so we have a reference. You don't need to hold all or any of those buttons to scale your mask, it's just that in this case it helps me so I'm using them because I don't want to distort the mask shape. Also, as I mentioned earlier, you can even rotate your mask and therefore your motion path by just moving outside the bounding box and using the bounding box rotation handles that appear. Anyway, I won't be rotating so let me just undo that. Hit enter to exit the free transform bounding box. Now let's get our new motion path over to our ball layer. Select the Mask Shape property and choose Edit, Copy. Next, select the Ball Layer's Position property and keyframes by clicking on the word Position. Again, this is really important because if you selected just the layer itself, the next few steps will create a duplicate mask shape on the Ball Layer instead of a new motion path for the Ball Layer. 
Before we do anything else, let's delete all of our position keyframes by hitting delete. Otherwise, we'll end up with a bunch of extra keyframes all mixed together. Now that there are no position keyframes, make sure the position property is still selected and choose Edit, Paste. The new keyframes are created. Since we no longer need it, let's delete the solid layer. Just get rid of it. If you take a look at our new keyframes, you'll probably notice two things. First, you'll see that the temporal keyframes, those are the ones in the timeline, are not located in the same place that they were originally, meaning that their timing has been kind of messed up. As I said earlier, this method of scaling the motion path isn't exactly perfect, and this is one of the reasons. Also, you'll see that every temporal keyframe except the first and last ones are round and smaller than normal keyframes. This tells you that the keyframes are roving keyframes, that is, they are not locked to time. Now, realizing I've opened a can of worms here, I'm going to suggest that you take a look in your After Effects help files for information on roving keyframes. I may do a tutorial on roving keyframes at a later time, but the quick explanation is simply this. Roving keyframes are a kind of position keyframe used to keep the speed of a layer's motion perfectly smooth, meaning that roving keyframes keep the layer moving at a constant rate of speed with no variation. And by the way, to clarify, when I said that they are position keyframes, I don't mean that they're spatial keyframes. They're actually temporal keyframes, but they are temporal keyframes that only are in relation to position values. Roving keyframes don't exist for any property that doesn't encompass some kind of position value. Now, there's a lot more to it than that, and I won't get into it for now. In this example, what's important is that if I move the keyframe at the end here, and I drag it to the last frame of our composition, the rest of the keyframes will expand to keep the motion smooth. Now, in your motion path, that might not be something you're interested in, which means you'll need to convert your keyframes from roving keyframes into temporal keyframes, which are locked to time. To do that, select the position property, which again selects all of our position keyframes, and click on the position property twirl down to reveal the position graph. You'll see that under each roving keyframe is an empty box. This is the roving keyframe checkbox. Since all of the keyframes are selected, just clicking in one box will convert all of them into keyframes that are locked to time. Unfortunately, all of the temporal keyframes are now linear temporal keyframes. So if any of your keyframes were originally Bezier or whole temporal keyframes or whatever, you now have to redo that by hand. Also, you'll need to move each keyframe to the correct position in the timeline to match your original animation's timing. Again, these are just more examples of the weakness of this method, and while usually it's not too big a deal, on the occasion that you have some complicated stuff going on in your timeline, I'd suggest duplicating your original layer so you can have a reference as to where keyframes should be placed in time and what type of keyframe to use. Then you can easily match them up by hand. Like I said, not perfect, but useful nonetheless. As always, I hope these little hints help you in the work that you do. Thanks for watching this tutorial. This is Aaron Rabinowitz for creativecow.net.